Okay, welcome back. This is number five, designing your fieldwork. And this is the point when um, having done a lot of planning, a lot of thinking about what it is that your NEA is going to be on, the sub questions, the methods that you've chosen. We're now at the point where before we go out into the field and collect our data, it's important that we consider what exactly it is that we are gathering and how we're going to do it, what equipment we're going to use, and lots of kind of small details like that to make sure the data that we get is actually going to be good quality and crucially relevant and appropriate. So to start off with, I'm just going to draw your attention to this word here, this word methodology. Um, this is one of the things that a geography report will normally include. And a methodology almost, kind of think of it a little bit like a, a set of recipes. It's essentially the step-by-step -step guide of what you've done and how you've done it for each of the methods that you've completed in your study. The other thing that's important to do, particularly at A-level, when you're writing about a methodology for all of the methods that you've chosen, is a justification of why you've completed those methods. So one of the things that most NEAs will include is a methodology section. And this might well be two, three, or perhaps even four pages of a grid. And very often students do a methodology in a grid. And the grid is laid out with each method taken one at a time, a description of how that method was done. Maybe there's another column which explains the equipment that was used and maybe the frequency and the scale and timings and things like that that were used and perhaps a justification as well. And systematically, people then work through their methods that they've used in their fieldwork. And they essentially describe and detail all the things that um, they've done with those methods in terms of how they've done them and all of the details in terms of um, why they've done them, the equipment they've used, this, this kind of timings and things like that. So a methodology is um, not always the most exciting thing to do, but it's pretty important to do it before you go and it helps you plan what it is exactly that you're going to do. So it's up to you really how you design your methodology and whether you do go down this route of having one big kind of two to three page grid. Some people try to integrate their methodology into their presentation section. That sometimes works quite nicely. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that perhaps a little bit later. But um, one of the things that your methodology should encourage you to do is to almost think about the things that the examiners are looking for when they're marking your study. And there are other aspects that you are encouraged to consider before you do your field work that actually it's a useful time to include that recognition that you've considered those things in your methodology. And you'll see in that first box there, it says it's also a good place to consider things like sampling, any ethical considerations or aspects and things like risks that might be associated with the fieldwork that you're doing. So the methodology is the area where you detail what you're going to do, um, detail how you're going to do it and justify why you're going to do it, but also is a place where you can show that you've planned your fieldwork really precisely and you've considered all the things that might influence the reliability, the validity um, of that method that you're doing. So what I'm going to do is, is move through a few different stages of the different things that you will perhaps need to consider when you are planning your fieldwork before you go. So we've got five boxes here on the screen. The first one is coloured green already because we've done that. I'm assuming that we're now watching this video having got to the point where you've picked the methods that you're wanting to use in your fieldwork investigation. So having got those, it's now this stage where we're actually trying to consider how we use those methods and um, the other aspects that uh, at this point we need to just be aware of. So the thing that we're going to talk about first is this thing called sampling. Um, again, this bit is perhaps the least glamorous part of fieldwork. It's not necessarily the, uh, the thing that is exciting, um, but it is the thing that examiners like to see evidence of. They like to see that you have planned things carefully and you've considered things and you've not just done things erratically and rashly, but actually you've planned a good field study by thinking about it before you go, not just going out to the seaside or to a city with the clipboard and just gathering information, but you've actually thought about the logical kind of aspect behind your data collection. So this is what this is all kind of buying into. So first of all, as I say, I'm going to consider this idea of sampling. So generally, if you think about it, all fieldwork, all studies really has to um, involve sampling because Sampling is where you take a selection of the available data. 
Now, if you are going to do a study on anything, it's only really ever going to be feasible that you're only ever going to take a selection of the available data that there is. For instance, if you're going to do um, a study where you're looking at the effectiveness of some kind of um, improvement scheme or regeneration project and you were looking to get people's opinions on that, it's absolutely impossible, I would say, to get every single person's opinion on whether something has been positive or not because it's not going to be practical to interview or question every single person. So you say, OK, well, I'm going to ask 250 people and you decide how many people is going to be appropriate enough for you to sample. And that's essentially what sampling is. Sampling is where you kind of take a, a selection of the data that is available and it's up to you how much of that um, data you take. Um, these are the, the kind of the considerations that you're going to need to be um, thinking about. But it's then that you use that sampling to gain a, a kind of hopefully a, a wider picture of the whole. So a couple of tips at this point. Firstly, before we go into the different types of sampling, it's important that you just kind of think about the basics of a sample size. And this is probably one of the most commonly asked questions of teachers when people are planning their own independent fieldwork. The question of, miss or sir, how many surveys do I need to do? How many questionnaires do I need to ask? How many times do I need to gather that data? Or how many this and that do I need to do? So, well, we can kind of give you an idea, but it's really up to you. Um, what I would say is that generally, the exam board are expecting that students at A-level are doing four days of field work. Now, it could well be that a couple of those days are days where they're uh, expecting you just to learn about field work techniques. So in reality, examiners are probably expecting that for your NEA you would I would suggest have a couple of days two maybe three at a maximum a couple of days of data collection so don't plan to go and get 50 days worth of data so think about okay realistically then if I'm thinking about two days worth of field work data and let's say we've got eight hours in that day that I'm going to be working to collect my data <laughs> You know, you take into account your coffee breaks and chips and getting an ice cream and stuff like that. Let's say we've got eight hours. So in total, perhaps 15 to 16 hours worth of collecting field work would, I would say, probably be around about appropriate for an NEA study. So let's say for, for kind of rounding purposes that we're talking about 15 hours worth of data collection in total in terms of gathering your primary data. So you would need to consider then if that's the, the kind of the amount of time that you're working with. If you are going to do something like a questionnaire or you are going to do any kind of surveys, think about then allocating, a, you know, an appropriate amount of time out of the, the amount, amount of things that you're intending to do to that one method. So it might be then that you say, OK, well, for two hours on day one, I'm going to do questionnaires and two hours on day two, I'm going to do questionnaires. So in total, I'm going to do them for four hours. That might be a bit too much and you might actually hone it down to two to two and a half hours, something like that. But that will help you kind of gain an idea about the sample size and um, how many times you do each of these different methods. So have a bit of a think about it. It's kind of, I suppose, over to you to almost create a bit of an itinerary, really, for your field work. If you're going out for a couple of days, how are you going to make the best use of that time? And how much time are you going to allocate to each of the methods that you're intending to use? The second thing to, worth, to, um, to consider is from the data that you're intending to gather, how much of that data that you um, observe and collect is going to be fixed data? So by that, I mean, it's not going to change from one day to the next. And also how much of it is going to be variable data, so changeable data. So for instance, if you're doing something like a property quality survey or a land use survey, then that is fixed data. That's not going to be different on a Saturday to a Monday, and it's not going to be different from a summertime to the winter or you know any, any kind of short term period of time. So there's no point doing a survey like that twice because you're only ever going to get the same result. However, there'll be other bits of data, particularly things like, you know, pedestrian counts and surveys and things to do with rivers and um, coasts that will be much more changeable. So it might well be for some of the bits of data that you're thinking of collecting that you need to think, OK, well, I need to do this at least on two different occasions, maybe over two different days. I might need to do it perhaps over five days and that 15 hours of field work that we're talking about, you might have, have to actually divide up into three hours over five days over a particular week. So again, these are decisions that are going to come down to you. But you'll need to think about that. What data am I collecting actually might change from day to day and I might be beneficial collecting 
over several times. Finally, on this page, we're going to talk about three different types of sampling techniques. And ultimately, it's up to you to select which of those sampling techniques you think is going to be most appropriate to each method. And I would suggest that in your methodology, you perhaps refer to which sampling technique you've chosen and why you think it was the best and most um, suitable uh, method and perhaps the one that gives you the most reliable or accurate results. OK, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to move on to the uh, same picture, but starting to consider these three different types of sampling. And I'm sure you've probably come across these before, whether it's in science or, or some other um, geography study that you've previously done. But we have these three different types of sampling. The first one that we've got is random sampling. Now, with sampling, to start off with, I should say, the best thing to do is to try and define your sample area. And what we've got on the screen here is a, a section of about a kilometre along Southwold shoreline. You can just see uh, the lighthouse, hopefully there. Our centre is about two streets away from the lighthouse. We're just a little bit further inland. But this is our coastal classroom, really. This is where we do all of our courses. And particularly within that red zone, that one kilometre, you can see we've got some groins and some evidence there of longshore drift. And you can see that it's a really good location for doing coastal studies. And we're fortunate we've got a town next door to the beach as well, where we can do lots of um, human urban studies too. Um, for doing coastal studies, then, this one kilometre stretch of coastline is, is really handy um, because there's significant change along that one kilometre and we've got different forms of coastal management and we've got different levels of beach height and um, different kind of width of the beach along this, this section as well. So very often we find students focusing on this one kilometre section. But when they're doing their NEAs, it's up to them where within this one kilometre they choose to go to. And obviously when they're doing sampling, they want to try, if possible, to get a, a fairly even spread of the whole, um, whole location. So the idea of sampling then is that you are selecting your sampling sites within a, a, a kind of a, a broader area that you've um, kind of narrowed down to. So we've got this one kilometer area here and we're saying that we're going to have some sampling sites within this area. So for this instance, we're going to choose 10 different sampling sites. Now, random sampling is obviously very random. And the way in which you can get that is by um, using a, a random kind of number generator online. You could even perhaps just have numbers in a hat and pull those out. But the idea of randomly selecting your sampling sites is to avoid bias and to make uh, any kind of human influence completely minimal and to get you know, this, um, this selection of sites within a zone which hasn't had any kind of human interference. Problem with randomly selecting sites along this one kilometre stretch could well be that if you perhaps typed in um, a thousand into uh, into a, a random number generator and you then got 10 numbers out of that, you might well get nine numbers that are all below 100 and they might all be clustered together within the first 100 metres. So you can see on the screen here, we've got five or six stars or sites that are all clustered towards that one end of the beach. Now, this is one of the problems of random sampling is that because it's taken out of your hands, you could well get results that all kind of cluster sites together and you're not necessarily getting a, a full proportional representation of the whole area. So very often people consider other alternatives and probably um, in theory, systematic sampling is the best because this systematically divides up a section like this 100, um, there's the one kilometer section that we have at our shore and it avoids bias as well. And you would say, OK, well, I'm going to sample 10 sites along here. So I'm going to do one at 0, 100, 200, 300 metres all the way along the shore like that. And that is fine in terms of giving us a, you know, a nice, consistent um, distance between each of those sites. But one of the problems that systematic sampling sometimes creates is an issue of access. And if you think about perhaps if this was a high street or a river, it might well be that 800 metres down that river, you've got uh, a weir or a waterfall or something that means that it's not necessarily appropriate and safe for you to go and take your fieldwork data from that site. Equally, if it was a, a high street, it might be that 200 metres down the road, you've got um, a junction or a, a roundabout and you're not going to be able to stand there and count your cars literally in the middle of a road. Uh, here, you can see that this uh, second closest star towards uh, me is located on the pier. 
so that's not necessarily going to be appropriate for you to to do field work from that point within the, the peers kitchen and then the, the one closest to me um, has got uh, a, a rock groin there so that would probably be um, a fairly unsafe place to stand actually on the, those kind of slippery um, algae covered rocks the other problem that you sometimes have on the beach which we very often find in the summer is that um, the groins are used as a bit of a windbreak by lots of families and so around the groins on the beach you actually get clustering of families and, and groups where people are kind of of setting up their their um, their space on the beach next to the groins and we then turn up trying to measure the sand height around those groins and find that on lots of them there are people kind of based uh, next to them and therefore we can't actually access those groins so that makes it a bit tricky for us so you wouldn't want to go up to a family and say would you mind just moving while i measure this groin or while i measure this measure this beach so systematic sampling can sometimes be quite frustrating if you're trying to rigidly stick to it Therefore, that's why people very often will go with the third option, which is stratified sampling. And this, I suppose, in essence, in, in its kind of simplest form, is where you try to, to as much as you can, use stratified uh, uh, systematic sampling, but you've actually got more freedom to move your sites either one way or the other to make them um, more accessible and more appropriate. But ultimately, the, the idea of stratified sampling is where you divide up your overall um, sampling location into more manageable smaller chunks I suppose these are called strata these kind of smaller zones and they're supposed to represent your total zone so here what we might do with this example on the beach is is divide our one kilometer stretch up into the zones between each of those groins and we might say okay well what we're going to do is actually we're going to take two samples from between each of those bays between um, between those two groins and that then gives us more of a an accurate measure we might choose to have um, one sample site which is exactly between the two groins and we might then choose to have one which is just to the south of one of those groins and so therefore within each of the, the groin sections we've got two different um, measurements so there's a bit more freedom with stratified sampling you can if you're trying to do it really kind of um, rigorously you could actually look at weighting your sample so it might well be for instance that if you're doing a, a an age survey that if you are taking um, surveys across a town that actually you're aware by doing a pedestrian count that footfall is higher maybe 50 percent higher in the high street than in surrounding residential areas and therefore you might choose to do 50 percent more surveys in the high street than in residential areas of looking at um, the age of people because that's a proportionally more um, populated area so you can use stratified sampling to kind of weight your samples as well and again it just gives you a bit more freedom ultimately as I say in your methodology it might be an idea to refer to which sampling technique you've used and just justify why you think this was the most appropriate for that method okay so we've spoken a bit about sampling and the next thing that we're going to talk about is this idea of frequency and timings and again this might form a heading in your methodology table where for each method you just refer to the considerations you uh, weighed up in relation to the frequency and timings and sampling for each of those methods so again these decisions are ones that were taken out of your hands when you're doing field work um, at GCSE and, and in lower school but these are now going to be very much down to you so frequency refers to obviously timings and, and and how many occasions that you're getting data from so as i said you're going to have to think about how many different visits you're going to make to each of those different field work locations that you're intending to go to and those different sampling sites within those locations at each site you then will need to think about how many times do i do this survey um, if you're doing something like a a velocity test where you're timing how long it takes an orange for instance to move uh, down a particular set of uh, a, a part of the river or a stretch of the coastline you might need to think well how many times do I need to repeat this do I need to do that twice or do I need to do it five times should I do it ten times how many different parts along this beach or along this river do I actually need to do that test again that frequency aspect is going to be your decision and what you're going to need to do is to kind of think about well what's going to give me the best results now obviously the obvious answer to that is 
the more you do something, the more reliable your results are going to be. But again, think about that maybe 15 or 16 hour time frame that you've got for your field work. And I wouldn't suggest that you spend two weeks just dropping an orange into a river and just timing it so that you've got a thousand results. And so you know exactly the velocity on average of that river. That's a bit too much. So it's going to be up to you to justify within a kind of a rational time frame how many of these surveys that you do for each of the different methods that you're intending to use. Secondly, in terms of timings, then this also is going to be something that you're going to have to consider if you're doing pedestrian counts, traffic counts, age surveys, velocity tests, all of these things where you're using a stopwatch. How long are you going to time for? Um, is a minute going to be appropriate? Is that going to be long enough? Um, is five minutes going to be appropriate? One of the things that I would say at this point is don't be afraid to adapt and change your fieldwork once you've started your fieldwork, particularly with the methodology of how you're doing your data collection, because you may well find that actually you had written in your methodology that you were going to time your pedestrian counts for 20 minutes and you're stood in these residential areas and you realise very quickly that there's absolutely nobody about and you're just standing there wasting your time. So it might be better to go and visit more places and perhaps do a two or three minute count rather than just standing in one street for 20 minutes and not seeing anybody and getting wet. That would be awful. Wouldn't it? <laughs> so adapt your fieldwork as you go along. If you find that things are not perhaps as you expected and are not written as you uh, and are not kind of working out as you've written them in your methodology, don't be afraid to adapt it and change it. And actually don't be afraid to, to write that you've done that as well, because your fieldwork should evolve essentially and it doesn't uh, undermine you by um, you admitting that actually you've kind of adapted your field work it actually shows that you've been you've been quite mature about it and you've, you've re recognized that your data can be better if you were to adapt it and slightly tweak it so don't worry about that finally in that pink timings box uh, it says how will you coordinate gathering data from different sites at a similar time now, this can be an issue, for instance, if you're looking at perhaps comparing two or several places and multiple places. So, for instance, if you're looking at perhaps a, a difference between footfall between somewhere like a pier, for instance, and at the same time, the high street, and you're trying to assess which place is busiest, then what happens if you're in one location and you can't be at the other location? So you can if you want to. Uh, you, you can recruit members of your family or friends to help you with your data collection. That's absolutely fine as long as they're completing the methodology in the way in which you are completing it elsewhere. So it's absolutely fine to recruit in people uh, to help you gather your field work. So it might well be that at 12 o'clock exactly, you coordinate a synchronized pedestrian count of several locations around a town. That would be a really accurate way of doing it. But obviously, it's not going to be possible for everybody to do it. And it might be quite hard to encourage people, your brothers and sisters, to come out and hold a stopwatch and count people. So think about how you could get around these things. Um, and again, if you can't get around it, that's fine. But rather than perhaps try to brush it under the carpet, just make a note of it and acknowledge that that perhaps is one of the weaknesses or limitations of your method, that it was impractical to exactly synchronize your data collection at the same time from one place to another and therefore your results are inevitably going to be slightly inaccurate uh, again it's not a problem to acknowledge that okay uh, this is something that probably unless you were kind of told to consider it is something that you wouldn't necessarily um, worry about including into your NEAs but there are marks available for considering the ethical impact of your field work and so it's kind of a hoop that we would encourage you to jump through just to make sure that you're collecting those marks that are available so by this, we mean that field work that you undertake shouldn't has a, have a negative impact on anybody, shouldn't have a negative impact on people that you're questioning or that, um, you know, people that live in the areas or work in the areas that you're investigating. And it shouldn't have a ne negative impact on the environment either. So there should be no lasting negative legacy of the field work that you're doing. That goes without saying, surely. But this, just because it goes without saying, doesn't mean that you shouldn't highlight this in your um, study, particularly as there are marks allocated to it. So you will be doing things probably subconsciously without even realising that are reducing the impact of your field work. So one of those things would be, for instance, if you're doing questionnaires, um, you would perhaps approach people who are perhaps already sat down 
Um, you perhaps wouldn't approach those people as part of a group of maybe six or seven of you because that might be seen as intimidating. So you may well write for my questionnaire. One of the ethical considerations was that I would only approach people who were themselves with one other. So they perhaps didn't feel vulnerable being on their own and being approached by a young person. Um, I worked on my own and I only approach people in pairs, I approach people as they're sat down. Before speaking to them, I explained clearly what it was that I was doing. I told them that I'd only need two to three minutes of their time. Um, and I told them that their results would be strictly confidential. I didn't ask their name or their ages or addresses or anything personal like that to make sure that they, those people felt comfortable about um, liaising with me. So you might just have a little explanation of how you try to put people at ease and how you try to make sure that the data that you collected was ethical. In terms of doing kind of water-based studies, it might be that you're having to throw things in the water. So we use oranges very often as floats along our coastline. Um, and we use those to calculate the velocity and the direction and, and strength of longshore drift. Now, they're not always great oranges. Sometimes we, we lose them. And it might be perhaps uh, better to have a big, I don't know, two litre plastic bottle of Coke that we throw into the sea because it's going to float. But obviously, ethically, there's no way that we would do that. And so by using something that's biodegradable, like an orange, it's much more, um, you know, ethically sound. And so that would be something that would be appropriate for us to write into our methodology that, uh, you know, one of the things that we did to reduce the impact of, of this method was to use something that was organic and, and biodegradable. Might well be that you talk about how you've traveled to sites and you're if, particularly if you're doing a local study. One of the reasons that you're traveling to that site is that it's accessible by public transport or that you can get there by foot and you're not having to use a car. So literally anything that you can think of, make a note of it at a time and, and then try to include that into your methodology table if it's appropriate. And you will then be able to tick that box when your teacher is going through the marking uh, criteria and they will be able to say, yep, that's good. They've considered some of the ethical aspects of their study. Last one, um, again, not necessarily something that you perhaps always think about including within your fieldwork. And there isn't actually a specific requirement that you do complete a full risk assessment for your fieldwork, but I would perhaps encourage it because it does show, again, good planning. And it shows that you considered all of the aspects of your um, field work that perhaps could go wrong, but that need careful thought before you go and do them. So you could do a very basic, simple uh, additional risk assessment if you wanted to, or you could perhaps just in your methodology table highlight some of the risks. But the key thing when you're doing a risk assessment or you're referring to it at all is that essentially you're highlighting the risk. You're talking about uh, what that risk is. And then you're talking about the steps that you can take to reduce the likelihood of that risk happening. There are various different elaborate forms of risk assessment, and you might choose to do much more elaborate form of risk assess assessment. It's absolutely fine. But at a minimum, that's kind of what they're designed to do. They're, they're designed to identify risks and give you the opportunity to talk about how you reduce the likelihood of those risks happening. So when we're doing this for GCSE, we kind of encourage the students to think about essentially the person that they know who has got the least common sense. That's probably somebody come into your mind already. But that's what we as teachers have to do. We have to plan for the person who's going to be on our courses or on our trips that has got the least amount of common sense. And therefore, we have to highlight any possible risk that could happen and could materialise. And even if it's a really blindingly obvious thing, we have to think about that person and we have to then outline what steps we're going to take to make sure that that risk is minimised. So for coastal studies in particular, the first thing that I do when I know that we've got a school coming on a particular date is I look at the tide times and then I design our fieldwork day around the tide times because there are parts of our coastline here that are inaccessible at high tide. And there are other parts of the coastline which are much better to access at low tide. So having a look at tides is a really useful thing to do for us. And again, if you're studying um, coasts as part of your NEA, it might be something that you look into before you do your fieldwork day. I would suggest a really good website is called Tides for Fishing. And if you just type that into Google, it will come up. Uh, it's tides, the number for fishing.com or .co.uk. And uh, you can see on the screen, there's a little kind of um, line graph there 
um, and that is showing the the state of the tide on the day so we we use that with uh, our planning all the time another thing that you can be aware of you know a few days in advance of, of going is obviously the weather making sure that um, the weather on the day that you're planning to do your field work is going to be suitable and this is your field work this is your trip so it might well be that if the weather is looking pretty horrific that you can just change the day and go on a day when it's going to be more suitable for you collecting data um, it wouldn't necessarily be considered all that great that for your NEA that you wrote as one of the major limitations in your evaluation but actually on the two days that I decided that I was going to complete my field work it poured with rain the examiner might say well if it was your own study why did you go on those days why didn't you just go on a, a separate day so it's slightly different to GCSE when you're penciled in and scheduled into a specific day it's going to be up to you to choose which day you go and um, therefore I'd consider going on a nice sunny day okay so we've ticked those all off which is nice and these are as I say it's quite a straightforward basic thing this section um, but so many students miss out these easy marks and these are easy marks and as I said before for these things on the screen it's almost a case of making sure you include those in your methodology jumping through the hoops that the examiners have set and if you don't jump through those hoops you won't get those marks so make sure that you're not missing out on easy marks by considering those easy things to include in your study. Okay, before you go then, before you're out on your trip or out on your day's worth of um, field work, the key thing I would say to always keep sticking in your mind is it's not just about how much data you gather, but for this NEA, it's about trying to ensure that you're getting good data and quality data. So it's gonna be up to you to critically reflect on what you're doing and scrutinize yourself before you go about whether what you're intending to do is good enough it's up to you so the first thing that i would suggest that you just review is your sample size okay so you're about to go you're going to go to these places where you're going to collect your data so that question of saying to miss or sir miss how many questionnaires and surveys do i need to do well that's you that's going to answer it so ask yourself that question is my sample size appropriate where am I going to collect the data from? So what are going to be the sites on that street or in this woodland or on that hill or on that beach, or that river where I'm going to go to? And if you don't know that, maybe do a recce first. Maybe go and just try and work out what are going to be the best sites for me to base myself to collect the data that I need. You should also at this stage be thinking, will I need to go on multiple dates? Am I just going to blitz this and do one day dust till dawn getting all of the data that I need? Or is it actually going to be much better for my data in terms of its reliability that I do it over multiple days and I'm perhaps just doing a couple of hours a day for a week maybe? And the other one, do I need support? Do I need someone with me? Do I need to recruit you know, a friend or a member of the family to help hold some ranging poles or hold a tape straight or record um, pedestrians on one street while I'm on the street next door? So do I need backup? All of these things, think about it. It's up to you to kind of make sure that you've got the right answers. Recording the data. Um, how are you going to do this? So we have got Jogit. Jogit will enable you to record a huge amount of data on a huge amount of different uh, methods. And that's absolutely fine to use your phone. You can use your phone for recording interviews as well uh, and notes. But it might well be that a clipboard is still appropriate and you perhaps take a little pad if you don't want to hold a clipboard and look, I don't know, like somebody who's particularly like a train spot or something like that. So think about it, though. How are you going to record your data? And you're going to need to have that prepared before you actually step into your fieldwork zone. Number three, what equipment will you need? So for this, imagine getting a train down to the coast and standing there and thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to need a ranging pole. Oh, and a clinometer. I've not even got a pencil. So think about that. What equipment are you going to need and organize that before you go? Think about sun cream as well. That's always a good one. And some snacks. But obviously more technical than that. Think about the technical equipment you're going to need for your field work, not just sun cream and snacks. Uh, constantly, these are the three key themes that you should be thinking about for A-level quality field work accuracy how precise is the data that you're gathering 
what's influencing the precision. So for instance, if you're holding a tape and you're doing things like a beach profile, for instance, is the wind affecting the precision of the, um, the uh, distance readings that you're having to take? And if it is, make a note of it. If it's impossible to kind of alleviate that problem, make a note of it so it's something that you can um, talk about when you're talking about the limitations. But what are you doing to make sure that as much as possible your data is watertight and it's precise? Because having accurate data makes quality data and trying to take these steps in your planning will be something that, again, gives you um, a huge amount of credit. Secondly, another key word is reliability. So by this, we mean that if you're gathering data, how likely is it that that data is going to be the same if you were to gather it again? How reliable is that one result that you've got? And if it's not reliable, then do you need to gather several of those results to get an average to make that interpretation more reliable? So it's up to you to try and work out again what's reliable, what's variable data and whether you need to take repeated samples of that data to enhance reliability. And finally, this is definitely something that you need to be thinking of all the time, the validity. So how valuable is that piece of data that you're gathering in general? And how much is it actually contributing to the sub questions and the issue that you're trying to prove? So you've got to be thinking all the time, actually, is this, is this helping me? Is this worthwhile? And again, if it isn't, then think about, well, maybe I don't need to do it, or maybe I need to change it and tweak it, and maybe I need to change the phrasing of this question. If you're doing a questionnaire and you've got two or three questions that are in there that you're not really sure why they're in there, maybe you need to reflect on that and, and think about that. If you're asking people, for instance, where they've come from or how long they're staying, are those results actually useful? Do you need to ask those questions? Is that adding any value at all to your study? So these last two points I promise i'm almost done these last two points i think are, are worth uh, reflecting on first one here could a statistical test be used to improve the reliability of some of your data now if you're not familiar with statistical tests i would suggest again you get this document out produced by the royal geographical society as i've said on a previous uh, video this is available for a free download um, online and it's a hefty PDF but it's got loads and loads of tips about how to collect data how to present data but I'd say importantly as well from a student perspective it's got lots of ideas about statistical analysis and when to do statistical statistical analysis and which tests are going to be the best ones to do now statistics do not have to be in NEAs there's no specific requirement that you include a stats test in your NEA now, some teachers might tell you different to that, but there isn't. There's no there's no requirement to include a stats test because there's no point doing a stats test unless you need to do one. Now, the only time that you need to do a stats test is, re is to remove an element of doubt or subjectivity about the interpretation of your results. So if your results are not clear, then it actually is a good idea to do a stats test to get a clear, proven, black and white definitive answer. Now you can only do that if you've got enough data. So most stats tests will require at least 10 sets of data for you to complete a stats test. And by doing a stats test, you then get a much more reliable result because you're able to categorically prove whether a relationship exists or a correlation exists, etc. So think about whether your data lends itself to having a statistical test done on it and if it does that then firstly might influence how much data you need to collect so you'd need to get at least 10 sets as i said and it might well be that you then consider all things like your sample sites and where you need to go to and you know how, how often you need to repeat things as well so if you're unfamiliar with stats tests have a look at this document have a, a chat again with your teacher and just ask them the question do you think that some of my data might benefit from me doing a stats test? I'm thinking that I might do one for this. Do you think that's a good idea? They will probably say yes, but you'll need to kind of have a good idea as to why it is that you're doing a stats test and how that's going to enhance the reliability of your data. Okay. Finally, I think this is well worth saying and just stressing. Don't be afraid to change your methods once you start your data collection because very often as i've said previously you'll start collecting your data you'll maybe start doing surveys or questionnaires and you might then start realizing that actually this could be better if i changed it so it 
was a bit more like that or maybe the, the scale or the spectrum or the words that I've included here aren't quite right don't be afraid to evolve your fieldwork as you can as you carry it out and uh, again don't be afraid to write that you've done that to show that actually you've adapted and um, ultimately you've created something which is you know more useful okay it's a lot to think about isn't it but if you think out about all of these things I think you're going to have a pretty good successful NEA now we're going to have one more session I think where we're going to be looking at uh, presenting some of your data I'm going to talk to you a bit more about Jogit and how that can be used to gather your data and um, hopefully you're getting a bit more confidence a bit more awareness about what this NEA is all about and you're starting to feel like you're ready to go good